Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. It's like coffee with an analyst, or it could be whiskey with an analyst reading a spreadsheet, linking crime events, identifying a series, and getting the latest scoop on association news and training. So please don't beat that analyst and join us as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has 19 years of law enforcement analysis experience. Some with NYPD, some with Hempstead, and some with John Jay College. He earned a PhD studying micro-level spatial temporal analysis of crime, place, and business establishments. He's here to point out all of your mapping mistakes. (laughs) Please welcome Dr. Christopher Herman. Chris, how are we doing? Um, Very well, Jason. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate uh, you dropping off your card at the IACA conference and your business card you wrote on there, Recovering NYPD Analyst Supervisor, which made me chuckle out loud when I saw it. Well, I think all of us that either work currently or have worked with law enforcement, right, when you get out, there's always kind of that that interim period of you're not really retired, you're you're not getting paid by the department or the agency anymore, but you're still doing work for them or you're still maybe contributing to some of the work that they're doing. So I I feel like I'm I'm stuck in that ongoing, you know, interim analyst, um, unpaid volunteer helper, just because I, you know, I have a lot of analysts that I'm still friends with at NYPD. And then I've trained a bunch of them as well. So we maintain those connections, whether it's through LinkedIn or through text or through a chat. You know, there's there's always something going on every week. It's, it's very interesting. All right. Well, very good. Well, how did you discover the law enforcement analysis profession? So I actually got really interested in crime mapping, crime analysis, working on an ambulance. So I put myself through undergraduate. I was a fire science and forensics major at John Jay back in the early 90s, back when there was really a lot of crime. <laughs> <laughs> Not only in New York City, but really around the United States. The, the 90s were a pretty busy time for police departments. But I was working in South Jamaica, Queens, which is kind of like one of the hot spots for crime in New York City, still is today. And I just got exposed to, I mean, I was interested in the medical aspect of working on the ambulance, but I got exposed to so much crime on working on the ambulance, whether it was, you know, shooting victims or assault victims or robberies or injured police fire. I kind of got enamored by this, you know, whole crime thing that, you know, I ended up doing my master's and PhD in criminal justice, both through John Jay. So did you initially want to be an EMT? Is that what was your initial dream? uh, No, originally, my original dream was was really, I come from a family of firemen, actually. So my Mm. original dream was to, you know, be like an arson investigator or a bomb investigator. I was kind of interested in, in, you know, large fires or even like the, you know, explosions, you know, again, bomb, bomb stuff. So most of my undergraduate work and studies were really focusing on on that. But again, when I was working on the ambulance, I became so kind of interested in crime that I slowly kind of converted or, you know, I took all of that crime scene kind of experience, again, the the forensics and the fire, fire science, and kind of transitioned it to criminal justice. And then really, and then that's when I was in graduate school, I picked up on mapping and GIS and I, you know, started using Esri products back in the, back in the the late nineties, early two thousands, back when it was ArcView. And again, I just, you know, once I started actually mapping, that's when a lot of it really started kind of clicking to me. It started making sense. I started seeing patterns. I started kind of understanding things at different levels, let's call it. Mm -hmm. So that's when it kind of became real to me. So, you know, right around 2000. I find it interesting with the ambulance because I'm always fascinated with what people did before they were analysts and then certainly what they do after being analysts. It's got to be a really interesting perspective of what you saw on a nightly, daily basis working on an ambulance. What do you think you learned as an working on the ambulance that helped you with analysis work? So when you work on the ambulance, obviously you're treating patients, right? So Mm -hmm. you're really focused on, in this case, the victims of crime, you know, Mm -hmm. sometimes the offenders, you know, who maybe whatever got shot or maybe got beat up or Mm -hmm. tossed in front of the train, whatever, but you're, you're primarily focused on a victim and their, you know, their, their, not only their, their health, but also their mental, emotional health. So I I think, you know, in that 
gives you a different perspective really on crime. Cause a lot of times uh, I was certainly guilty of this when I was working with the New York city police department, you know, a lot of times I'm just looking at dots on the map and, mm-hmm. you know, every once in a while I would have to remind myself and remind others like, Hey, these aren't just dots on a map, right? These are victims. These are people, these are, you know, there's, there's families attached to this, or there's a lot of kind of emotional, you know, things that are attached to all of these, you know, crimes, because that's what, that's what they are. So yeah. I, I think, again, with that ambulance experience, again, you, you, ha- you come, come with a different perspective, which is, you know, you, you know, you know, you've known, you've seen, you've heard, you've smelt all the different things that victims have gone through, whether it's in their homes, whether it's on the street, whether it's, again, in the subway after the, after the shooting occurred, whatever the case is, you know, you really get to see the, the beginning, middle end of sometimes, you know, this, this victimization process, which, again, as an analyst, you know, you don't, you don't get exposed to. Also, Joel Kaplan from Rutgers, you know, the guy, one of the one of the inventors and developers of the SimC product. He's also a uh, former ambulance guy turned. Uh, oh, I didn't know that. Turned crime analyst, turned PhD. Yeah, as well. Yeah, Joel Kaplan. Okay, and so when you're studying graduate level and you're at John Jay, you, you said you got into mapping and get into geocoding and get is is data pretty available at this time for you or you you scrape at the bottom of the barrel no there was some data available again john jay does have a kind of good working relationships with the with the new york city police department um Mm -hmm. again that goes back kind of decades and then the fact that john jay is a very kind of international college as well so there's always kind of projects going on or research going on that typically involves some kind of mapping and then in the beginning, you know, I was one of the few people at John Jay that really kind of understood mapping and how to do it. So I was getting a lot of requests kind of to, oh, can you look at this? Can you help me map that? You know, can you make this map for me? Which really kind of increased my exposure at John Jay, but then also gave me kind of, you know, interesting experiences working on different types of projects. Okay. And then, so how did you make it to NYPD? So the NYPD thing was interesting because I was just, you know, I was in the PhD program. I'm working on my dissertation, which which you said is on micro level spatial analysis of crimes and its relation to business types. And one of the police commissioners at the time was a professor of mine. And he heard that, oh, uh, Herman was working on this and we're working <laughs> on that. And then before I knew it, he's like, hey, like, I, I got your job at headquarters. I really want you to take this job. You know, we're oh. going to pay you. Like at the time, I'm making like $23,000 a year, <laughs> you know, adjuncting at John Jay and kind of being a PhD slave. And he's like, we're going to pay you $80,000 and, you know, you get to work on your dissertation on Fridays and it's a really, you know, kind of great opportunity and I really want you to take it. So, <laughs> you know, so before I knew it, you know, I'm at, head, at NYPD headquarters, uh, which is really kind of one of the best uh, crime mapping or crime analysis kind of labs in the world, I think. I yeah. just got so much you know, there's just such a, a, a just an expansive infrastructure. And again, you just got hundreds of analysts working on all these different projects. So there's just great technology and, all, you know, the real-time crime center was started there. You know, we're the, the inventor of CompStat. So we have, you know, decades of kind of great crime data available that, that can be mapped or was mapped already. You know, that goes back to 1993. So yeah, I, again, it was, a, it was a great opportunity. I was Happy to make sixty thousand dollars more a year uh, hmm. as a as a PhD student, and again, I got a lot of great experiences and made a lot of great friends, and I really enjoyed my time at NYPD. I I can't kind of say bad things about it. Yeah. So when you were walking in for the first time to NYPD, it, it's all college from here. It's your first police department gig, so to speak, and certainly you know your way around mapping but you're also at the CompStat Mecca, as you said. And so I guess when you think back at your first days walking in, what comes to mind? Is there something that sticks out, maybe that's silly now or interesting? It was definitely overwhelming at first, right? Because if any of you have been to NYPD headquarters, it's in, you know, it's in downtown Manhattan. It's, it's right by City Hall. It's a pretty, pretty big building. You know, I, I'm only, you know, I'm, I'm two floors below the police commissioner's office and I'm kind of working on, you know, I was told I was going to be working on kind of 
um, assignments and stuff, you know, for the police commissioner. So, so yeah, th there was a little bit of a, of a high stress, kind of high pressure, you know, is the new kid going to be able to do it kind of thing. And then I'll be, uh, so the first kind of funny, funny thing that happens when I get to NYPD is they put me in front of a computer and they're like, all right, Chris, we need you to start mapping this out and mapping that out and doing some statistical work on some of these crime control programs that they got going on. But I noticed that, that, like it's just map info on the computer and then i'm remembering that oh no like i forgot that nypd uses map info like they're the only ones in the world i think or they're the only <laughs> police department in the country that is using map info and i was like oh i'm an esri guy like i've been using esri for a while i've been trained on esri i've been taking all these college classes in esri i'm like i don't really, i don't know how to use map info and number one and number two I was kind of like very adamant about not learning it. I was kind of like, <laughs> I was kind of like, like anti-map info. And I'm like, Esri is such a better product. There's no way that I'm even going to spend time learning this. And my boss was very like, at the time was very much, you know, well, you really need to learn how to do some of the basics with it. And I'm like, definitely not. Like, just tell me what I need to do. You know, I installed like a student copy that I had on the, on my computer at work and was yeah. able to use it for a few months. And then I reached out to my local Esri office who I kind of already knew. And uh, the local New York City Esri people are great and they know me well. And they're, they've always been very generous and given me whatever I need. But long story short, you know, NYPD is now officially an Esri shop and I don't even know if they have map info on their computers. So I, oh, I always I consider myself one of those, like I was one of the pioneers that was like, you know, like, hey, you got to get off the map info. You got to get onto the Esri platform. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's so that, uh, it's a... funny because when I started, there was one guy that championed Map Info and the other championed the Esri product, which was ArcView, as you mentioned. They came up with names for each other's software. The one said it was Crap Info. Yep, Crap Info. And then the other one said it was AssView. Yeah. So that, but that, like, people don't understand that now. There used to be a banter back and forth, like it was Coke and Pepsi or something like that. And yeah, now it's in, not back, even, of course, yeah. Back in the day, there was a legitimate, I think, competition with, yeah. you know, uh, and again, you know, Esri's been around for decades. Uh, mm. But again, Map Info, you know, ha had a pretty big parent company that was dumping a lot of money into it. And uh, I mean, NYPD was spending at least a half a million dollars on map info licenses for, uh, you know, for the longest time. And I remember like looking at the invoice once and I'm like, like who even uses this product anymore? Like, you know, <laughs> I, I think we're like throwing away half a million dollars here, which is oh, you know, NYPD. Sadly, that's not a big, big chunk of change, you know, like with a, with a six or $7 billion budget, you know, they don't, they don't really pay attention to that. Yeah. So then what other projects do you work on during your time here? So the big thing that I was working on at NYPD was the Operation Impact. So it was a crime control and crime prevention program. So it was pretty much they were taking rookies that were just out of the academy. They were putting them on foot patrol. And I pretty much had this like mini police force. I mean, it, again, and a lot of people don't understand how large NYPD is and how dense New York City is. If you've never mm -hmm. been there, it's it's a it's a it's a much different place than you know almost any other city I've been to. But you need to understand, like like NYPD is almost fifty thousand strong. You know, we got hundreds of analysts that work there, both civilian and uniform. So there's no like one analysis unit or anything like that. I mm -hmm. was working at the at headquarters. So I was a part of that kind of centralized analysis unit. But even within headquarters, there was the CompStat unit, which was full of analysts, mostly uniformed. There was the Office of Management Analysis and Planning or OMAP. That's where kind of I was. And that was kind of like the research and development kind of area of NYPD. And then the chief of department had their own kind of analysis unit. And then real-time crime center, when that was developed, they had their own analysts. So there's, you know, a lot of analysts that are working on different projects, but there were a bunch of units that were working on this Operation Impact, which was, you know, we had about 800 rookie cops that we were able to send to different places. So typically, and these places were very kind of small, think like foot patrol, quarter mile area kind of places. Mm -hmm. We were able to kind of, move these large groups of rookies around to different places throughout the city. And we were pretty much focusing on very kind of current robbery and gun violence trends. So whenever there was, you know, hot spots of robbery or hot spots of gun violence, we would typically take a couple dozen of these rookies and we'd send them to the 
these different hotspots or different impact zones, you know, from week to week, this would kind of change. So what was interesting about it was, again, we were using that kind of real-time data that NYPD was known for. You know, we were using kind of the week, the week before data, and then we were putting, you know, kind of cops on the dots, as they like to say. And then, you know, we were evaluating how much did crime go down or how many arrests were made or what differences were there, you know, pre-sending the cops there and post-sending the cops there. So there were there was a lot of good kind of longitudinal analysis. And again, you really got to see the increases and decreases kind of quickly go up and quickly go down as well once you were kind of moving around these large groups of rookie cops. Okay. So you mentioned how dense New York City is and you're dealing with hot spots. And you're also dealing with maps that are two-dimensional. So how did you make all that work given given all those moving parts? Yeah, so I learned early on, I guess, not only doing mapping at John Jay, but also obviously at NYPD, that really mapping became, became a micro level thing. And the street segment really became the primary kind of unit of analysis. And you say that it's 2D, but again, I was always working in 3D because, man, we have some really tall buildings. Mm -hmm. A lot of our public housing is, you know, 10 plus floors. And you're talking about three or 4,000 people in one building. So I was always looking at, you know, things in arc scene or back in the day, 3D analyst, and just really looking at the vertical aspect of some of these crimes hotspots because again sometimes the crime hotspot on the street could really be narrowed down to just a couple dots or a couple buildings on the on the street segment so i was able to again a lot of times just using some of the simple some some tools in arcgis or in excel really kind of get down to the address level and then even sometimes to the floor level of a building you know where these crimes were occurring and reoccurring quite often Okay. So were you able to measure the impact of Operation Impact? Yeah. So the impact was good because not only did you, were you putting cops on dots, but then the, the following week you were evaluating, you know, what was the return on that investment? You know, you, you, you put a dozen cops on this one street segment, 12 hours a day for four or five days during that week. They made X amount of arrests. You saw crime go down Y percent, you know, then you had to make a decision. Do we leave those cops there? Do we move those cops to a new street segment or to a new, you know, group of street segments? So yeah, it was interesting to see, again, all these ebbs and flows of crime because obviously when we're taking crime when we're taking police officers away from some of these hot spots and they're getting and the hot spots are getting colder we take the cops away and then obviously right some of the crime returns there or gets displaced to a, to a different area so it was you know interesting to see again how quickly and how fluid i guess the process was with crime going down crime going up Cops going here, cops going there. Again, it it was a very dynamic way of understanding how analysis works. Okay, good. And then you also worked on Operation Ceasefire. Yeah, so that was, again, in during the PhD program, I got to work with David Kennedy, who's one of the founders of the Operation Ceasefire program, right, which is a, a gangs and guns kind of prevention and control program. And I, I really enjoyed that because, again, it gave me like a nice – behind the scenes look at at, as far as how gangs work and how gangs kind of operate and then from the law enforcement aspect of it or from the kind of criminal justice policy because we also worked with with prosecutors as well you really got to kind of see the uh, the different types of sticks and carrots that they would you know use against or use for the gang members So the goal was always trying to get younger gang members who weren't too involved in the gang or weren't too violent. The goal was always to try to get those people out of the gang um, Mm. prior to them really getting, you know, a a pretty, you know, a pretty big rap sheet or committing any kind of serious violent crimes. So, you know, there was offers of like free college or job assistance or resume help and, you know, mental health, alcohol, drug treatment. So there were all housing, you know, free transportation. So there were all these kind of great incentives that they were able to share with, again, these kind of low-level gang members with the hopes that they would leave the gang. And again, those gang members that made that decision to kind of leave the gang and take advantage of some of these incentives, you know, did pretty well. Almost, almost, you know, 95% of them at the time when we were doing it, you know, were, were getting out of the gang, were staying out of the gang for a year, were not getting in any kind of further criminal justice problems or trouble. 
So I thought this was like a, a big success. And it was, again, kind of nice to see how a project like that works from uh, from start to finish. That is interesting. Do you have any, I don't know if there's numbers that you could do, like how many people that you got to sign up for the program versus the number of people that rejected the program, didn't take any Oh, I think program. I would I would say the majority of people that were offered the program joined the program. So there was mm. so you know, again there were incentives on one end and on the other side of it there were also kind of like almost punishments waiting to happen. Like hey, we <laughs> we knew that you know, we know that you were selling drugs or we have evidence against you for maybe this minor crime or that minor crime or you're on probation already. Like, why don't, you know, your probation officer is telling you to do this as well. So why don't you kind of like help yourself out if you get in trouble again, or if you violate your probation, right, you're going to end up in jail prison for a longer period of time. So again, this is a way out of that, that, uh, that slippery slope that you're kind of already going down. So again, th there was a sticks part of it as well. It wasn't just a bunch of carrots that we were giving them. There was a sticks, you know, kind of punishment aspect that that the police and the prosecutors really kind of had typically again they, they had some evidence kind of against them that they weren't using yet and that's how that was working okay so you eventually work your way up to supervisor and 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 you are supervising both sworn and civilian because they have both sworn and civilian there at nypd correct correct yeah, uh, and most of the units throughout the department, whether it's the precinct-based analysis uh, analysts or the borough level, yeah, so the county level, and then obviously the, the all the different specialty units typically have their own groups of ana uh, analysts as well. Okay, and then are you still with the, the same goal of working on some of these special projects? Yeah, so really throughout my time at NYPD, which was only uh, only a few years, because once I was kind of getting done with, you know, the PhD program was also kind of reminding me, hey, you have to get done with your PhD. We know uh -huh. you got this great job at NYPD. We know that you're making more money than uh, some of the faculty at John Jay now. But w but you have to, you know, the P there is a deadline for a PhD everywhere. <laughs> so yeah. we want we want to remind you that you got to get your PhD done. So eventually I did have to leave NYPD, but while I was there, I, I worked on just a lot of really interesting projects. And then again, a lot of them were citywide projects. So it was kind of nice to see, again, the size and scope of some of these projects. I remember working on some of the Homeland Security kind of terrorism projects, you know, trying to find out all the different critical infrastructure throughout the city and then trying to find out, you know, do we have cameras on it? Do we have security guards there or cops there or... Again, how is this protected or, or safeguarded? So it was kind of interesting to see some of the, I guess, behind the scenes stuff that's, you know, again, I was born and raised in New York, but, uh, you know, for a, a lot of, a lot of those years, you know, I'm kind of not, not looking at or not even thinking about some of these behind the scenes things that are going on in and around New York City. Yeah. And I do find that that idea of target hardening certain terrorist targets, that, that is a fascinating topic. And I know the, there's certain stuff that you can and can't or will and will not talk about. Certainly understand that. But when you think about it and start doing the research and start start looking at all the different things that could possibly be targets, it's quite a list. It really is. I yeah, mean, it's a huge list. And, you, you know, what was interesting was, and again, this goes back to the the size and scope of the NYPD and the, the infrastructure that they had. I mean, I spent a lot of time up and up with aviation in the he NYPD head helicopters. I spent a lot of time on the waters with NYPD Harbor unit. So, again, you know, you, you just get to see the, the city from all these different perspectives and all the different problems. Like I remember being up up in the helicopter with the aviation unit and we're. We're, we're like looking around different parts of the George Washington Bridge, which is the, the main bridge that, you know, separates New York and New Jersey. And again, you get a five, you know, half a million cars that go over that bridge every day. So it's a pretty important, again, part of the NYP, the New York City transportation system. And again, like, you know, you're looking at this huge bridge and saying like, okay, what are the different ways that, you know, terrorists can attack this bridge or damage this bridge or you know, uh, what, what are the different things that can happen? And you're, again, you're, you're right. You're meeting with engineers, you're meeting with architects, you're meeting with all these different, you know, maintenance people that work on the bridge daily and, you know, know all the ins and outs of the bridge. Again, it gives you a totally different perspective when you, you know, whenever I cross that bridge now, 
<laughs> I always, I'm always like, you know, oh, there's so much about this bridge that I've learned over the years, but again, only because of my time at NYPD. Nice. So did you have to leave NYPD in order to finish your PhD? Pretty much. I mean, I, they, they always kept me busy. This promise of don't worry, you'll be able to work on your PhD while you're, you know, working at NYPD kind of really never, never happened like I thought it would. So again, it's obviously a 24-7, 365 operation. It's not like, you know, you can stop this or stop that. So there was always just a, a, a large volume of work that always needed to be done. I could never really focus on my PhD like I really needed to. So yeah, eventually, you know, kind of push came to shove and the PhD program was really kind of pushing me to finish up my doctoral work. And I wanted to do that. That was my my primary goal. And at the same time, bosses change and, and, and you know, the <laughs> job becomes better or worse, you know, some years. And, and it was just, I, I just said it was going to be time at the end of the year. And I remember my boss being like, you know, like, like on my last day, he's like, really? Like you're leaving? Really? And I'm like, yeah, like I put my papers in, I told you I was leaving. Like, I don't expect a big party or anything, but like, you know, you, you certainly have known about this. And there were a couple of people there that were very surprised because they knew I enjoyed my job there and I liked doing the work, right? Like the, the work aspect of it was always very interesting to me. And it still is. Uh, again, I, I still work on a lot of New York City crime problems now, even as a as an academic. So, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, I feel like right now I have the, the, the benefit of like an academic job, which is the, the same kind of great benefits that you would get and a good salary that I would get at a NYPD, but I don't have to work on, I don't have to work on Fridays. Hello, this is Brian Gray. And my advice for analysts is don't settle for mediocrity. If you want to be happy in this career, long-term, you can't be a minimalist. Just don't do what you're asked for. Do what you know is right. And don't ever, ever substitute quantity for quality and if you haven't found a way to put design to work for you, you're not doing your best work. Hi, I'm Jamie Roush, and I have a really important public service announcement for you. No one wants to hear your conversation on speakerphone in a public restroom. It's awkward for you and for anyone else who comes in. No conversation is that important. So let's get, talk a little bit about your dissertation then. Okay. So yeah, my dissertation was, it was, I was interested in, so these micro level patterns of crime. So think like hot spots and hot dots, but I was interested in why, why are these certain businesses or business types, or even sometimes land uses, why were these specific things such a big contributor to crime in certain neighborhoods? And I was able to, and again, my study area was the entire county or borough of the Bronx, which has always been one of the higher crime counties in the country. And I lived in the Bronx for 13 years. So at the time I was kind of living in the Northwest part of the Bronx. So it was very convenient for me. I did the majority of my GIS studies in my master's and also in my doctoral program at CUNY Lehman College, which is like right in the middle of the Bronx. So mm -hmm. I just feel like I had, again, all this good kind of Bronx knowledge. I was going to focus my dissertation on the Bronx, but I was really interested in, in digging down into these hotspots and finding out what is making this hotspot so hot or why is this hotspot continuously hot during specific days of the week or different times of day. So I really got kind of fascinated with spatiotemporal analysis and micro level mapping and again, even going so far as to look at specific buildings and look at specific floors. And again, why are these patterns of crime happening on, you know, specific floors of specific, you know, housing projects or, you know, large commercial buildings sometimes. Yeah. So what were the practical takeaways? So the takeaways were obviously that businesses and the, the routine activities, I was really, you know, Marcus Felsen really poured a lot of energy and, and thought into to, uh, this work when I started. I remember going over to Rutgers, again, going over the George Washington Bridge and meeting with Marcus Felsen, right? He's the originator of the routine activities theory. And Marcus was really, obviously, again, a, a, a genius when it comes to a lot of this stuff. And he was very much like, okay, you're going to focus on this and not that. And originally mm -hmm. I wanted to do all crime because I'm like, Marcus, I got all this great data, property crime plus violent crime. And he says, no, 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 just focus on this. 
and focus on that. So he was really good in helping me focus my dissertation on just property types and business types and working on street segments. So that's what my dissertation was all about. And again, the, the, the role of businesses really shapes the way that people move, whether it's going from work to leisure or work to recreation or recreation to home, you know, the, the, the way people move as far as transportation, as far as the streets they take, the streets they walk on, the subways or trains that they that they go home on or go to school on, like all those things really matter with all these victimization and offending patterns. Yeah. What do you think was the most difficult part of earning your PhD? Oh, well, I, you know, it's a marathon. It's not a 50 page paper. I think, you know, I mean, my, my PhD is, you know, I always laugh because I'm like, you know, my reference section is longer than like the, a lot of the the papers that my graduate students write now, you know, so my <laughs> graduate students will complain, Oh, I got to write a 20 page paper at the end of the semester. And I'm like, my doctoral reference section was like 35 pages long. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, so it's a little intimidating that it has to be an original contribution to the body of knowledge. Right. So you need to become the expert in whatever it is your dissertation is going to be. Mm -hmm. And then you have obviously much smarter people that are going to be kind of critiquing it. So there's always that kind of, uh, you know, people that are, bigger, better, stronger than me are going to be looking at this dissertation and, and mm. criticizing it and comment on it. But, you know, thankfully I had a, a really good dissertation team. So I felt supported throughout the process and yeah, that, that went really well. Okay. Yeah. I don't want to dissuade any listeners from going and getting their PhD. I just want to be very <laughs> sure. clear about that. I think it's a, I think it's a, a, a worthwhile investment. I, I think that you learn more in a doctoral program than you certainly do in a, in a graduate program, a typical graduate program. And then it, it really kind of forces you to come up with your own interesting project and then really, you know, complete it and be able to defend it. Yeah. I mean, in terms of my graduate, I, I mean, I have a master's in criminal justice, but to me, it was just an extra year of undergrad. That's basically how, what it felt like to me. So it wasn't even nearly the level of what you just described as a PhD. Yeah. The, the, the coursework is, is very intense that the, that first two years of coursework, you know, just taking classes, it's, it's, it's pretty demanding. Yeah. So, so I, I don't think that you would get that kind of anywhere else. And then again, just the bar is just set much higher, I think, at doctoral programs, right, as as well as it should be. So, yeah, there, there's a certain kind of pressure that you have to kind of put on yourself to really kind of do your best work. You know, I remember when I was going through the graduate program, the master's program at John Jay, where it was kind of like, hey, as long as I get a B, finish the program. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, you know, I used to call it my uh, my strive for mediocrity. You know, it was <laughs> like, hey, I'm just... You know, if I'm B's anything, above average, <laughs> if I get anything, if I get anything more than a B, I'm kind of like wasting my time, you know, like I, I should just be striving for a B and that's, that's all I need to get. But when you get to the PhD program, you know, your reputation matters, who you working, who, you know, your faculty advisors obviously want, you want respect from them. You want them to appreciate the work that you're doing and the time and energy that you're putting into this. And it's just a ridiculous amount of work, the, the, the dissertation itself. But, uh, but again, it's, it's very rewarding once it's done. And, and I'm, I'm very kind of proud of all those, yeah, different doctoral accomplishments along the way. Okay, good. And then, so you then have a stop in Hempstead PD, which is a suburb of New York City, correct? Yeah, Hempstead's maybe like 10 miles east of the Queens border. So Hempstead is kind of like the hotspot village or community on Long Island in the, in the Nassau County part of Long Island. So there's, you know, a, a couple things that are east of New York City. There's, you know, Brooklyn and Queens are actually a part of Long Island, but then there's Nassau County and Suffolk County. Both are, you know, suburbs of New York City, like you said, but Hempstead was like the one community that had a lot of crime, had a lot of shootings and homicides compared to every other community on Long Island, pretty much, or in Nassau County and Suffolk County, I should really say. So I actually met the chief at the time, chief of Hempstead. I meet him working on the Operation Ceasefire projects. Obviously, there's a lot of gangs going on in and around Hempstead. So I, I get to kind of know some of the Hempstead police people. And then they're pretty, they, they just kind of, it was very informal. Hey, Chris, why don't you come and take a look? Why don't you come to our headquarters and take a look? They had good data, but they had no crime mapping. They had no crime analysis going on. They had a pretty horrible record management system, which I'm sure every every analyst can, you know, say good things and bad things about <laughs> yeah. their 
record management system. That's a, that's an ongoing, you know, funny thing, I guess we could all make fun of. But anyway, so I, yeah, I just started doing some real basic mapping for them and got a lot of interesting and good successes. I think in the beginning of that, just again, the police identifying trends and temporal trends and just some of the basic hotspots and street segments. And I, you know, it became so popular that they started to, you know, pay me. And then eventually <laughs> it turned into a full-time job that again, I didn't want. So I was at the time training one of my graduate students on mapping and analysis. And I, I kind of offered her the job and, and she's still there today. So it's, I, I think it's a, it's a great story of police with no analytical unit, then like gets an academic guy to, you know, chip in a little bit of free time and get an analytical unit up and running. And then, you know, a graduate student comes and helps. And I think they might even have more than more staff now than just one full-time analyst. Yeah. What's, what was your graduate student's name? Kimber Seaman. Yeah. We could probably get her on the, on the podcast as well. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. Well, I actually have a new segment now, as we were talking in the prep call, you said that you had so many pet peeves that you can't keep it to just one public service announcement. So we can go over all the pet peeves that you have in law enforcement analysis. Yeah, I'm sure, you know, I, I guess I got a lot of pet peeves about analysis. Then I got a lot of pet peeves about Esri. And <laughs> I got a lot of pet peeves about training. So yeah, there's all kinds of pet peeves that I have. So the, the first I'll start off with is like why analysts should never put a Z score on a map because mm -hmm. it's almost impossible to try to explain or define a Z score to a group of cops. And then even more difficult to try to explain those Z scores to your police chief or police commissioner, whoever the whoever the higher ups are in the department. So don't put Z scores on a map. You can use the simple yellow, orange, red for a crime going up. You can use the simple a light blue to dark blue for a crime going down. But don't ever put, you know, Z dot zero zero three five four because a lot of people <laughs> just won't understand what that is and will only get more confused if you try to explain it to them. Yeah. Well, I'm impressed they're even calculating C score. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a typical part of the, you know, if you're good, if you're doing good single density, dual density mapping, then you're going to obviously get some Z scores. So I, I think that's one of the, the, the primary contributors to, you know, cops looking at these maps and saying, w what does that actually mean? And it's, oh, I'm sorry. I put those Z scores on there. Let me try to explain it to you in simple crime going up, crime going down kind of terms. The next one is analysts that put crime counts or numbers on their Corapleth maps. So the mm -hmm. Corapleth maps should mm -hmm. typically be regional kind of maps mm -hmm. or you're looking at larger aerial kind of maps. And again, obviously some areas are larger than others. So a lot of times, you know, unless you're controlling for area or unless you're controlling for population, I never feel like looking at a core plus map, there should be any, any crime counts on it or, or, or whole numbers. Let's, let's put it that way. So I'm a big fan of using denominators again, whether that's aerial units, crimes per square mile or crimes per linear foot. If you're looking at streets or if you're looking at population, obviously right crimes per thousand or crimes per hundred thousand is the standard that you know usually happens when we look at at crime rates my other big one is uh, i've moved on i think and again this goes back to my nypd experience i've moved on from hot spots and density areas to just really focusing on streets so i'm, I'm a big fan of streets as the primary unit of analysis i think that the police officers understand street segments really well I think that right, all the businesses and a lot of the transportation is done on streets. If you look at where the crimes actually happen. So one of the interesting variables that NYPD collects is they have a variable that, that actually explains, it's a simple one word. Where did the crime happen? Did it happen at a church? Did it happen on the street? Did it happen at a bar? Did it happen at a movie theater? So it's a very simple description of where did the crime occur? And if you sum up a lot of those violent crimes, with the exception of sexual assault, you know, streets will typically be the number one area or place, mm. lo you know, specific location where a lot of those crimes occur. So, again, I've always been a big fan of focusing on street segments because I think that's where all the all the action is at. Mm. Hmm. Now, it's fascinating. I, when I had Christopher Bruce on the show, 
you know, he said at one point in time, he was worried that analysts were doing too much mapping work, that the big portion of their week was spent either geocoding or, you know, working on maps or creating maps and that he was worried that the profession was just going to turn into crime mapping. And he says, now he says with Esri's technology and whatnot, he said, there's a lot of departments that don't even have Esri licenses, right? There's coordinates coming in and out from the records management system, so I actually wonder, well, if they don't have mapping programs, does the average analyst even know what the word geocode is? Yeah, I definitely think we have seen a swing, right? So I think you're right. I think in the 2000s and even maybe the early 2010s, there's a really big push for mapping. There's a really big push for understanding spatial. And then eventually, I think, temporal spatial temporal trends become a big thing but then you saw all the automation happening right you saw like the crime mapping.com and you saw all of these kind of websites that started to pop up or again record management systems all of a sudden have a mapping tool so oh look the records management management system can map all of our crimes out or the records management system can show you where the hot spots are and i think that that kind of took a lot of the the brain power almost away from a lot of police departments because again, they were relying on all these automated, uh, automated search or automated whatever services to show them where these patterns and trends were, but they didn't really have an analyst to explain it, to break it down, or they didn't have an analyst that was willing to dig down into those hot spots or, or hot streets maybe and find out what were the, again, specific businesses or properties or locations that were driving you know crime at this one location or on this one street segment. So, yeah, I, I do think that, that we've gotten away from the importance of mapping and spatial patterns of crime to some extent. And again, this, this, I guess this kind of goes towards my rant on training. You know, <laughs> are we actually training analysts to do what is necessary? You know, when I applied for my job at NYPD, even though I, you know, I had a connection and I, I was really kind of invited to work there, there was still, you know, they put me in front of a computer before I started. And they said, you know, here's here's data on a USB, on a thumb drive, you know, show me this, show me this, show me that. You know, like I had to jump through the hoops. I had to prove that I could do the work before I got the job. And I think a lot of times analysts come in and, and they're not formally trained, problem number one. And then problem number two is the departments are not willing to, to invest that time and energy or sometimes money into to training their analysts. You know, so I, I think that there's definitely a break, I guess, in this focus on mapping and spatial pattern analysis to automation, where, again, the, the computer's doing a lot of the work and spitting out the maps that people want or people think that they want, maybe, I guess. But again, there's there's no one that's there driving, I guess, the intelligence part of this or the really analytical part of this. And I, I think, yeah, that that's I think that's the difference nowadays between the departments that are doing well and are kind of innovative and are progressive, I guess, when it comes to some of these things and the, you know, the, the ones that are just kind of doing, again, just doing comp stat, maybe, you know, like comp stat is good enough. We're, we're getting our numbers. We're producing a couple maps. Like that's all we need to do. Again, we're not, we're not really digging down into what the problems are or who are the top 50 offenders in my jurisdiction you know, I, I think that there's a lot of good things and best practices, I guess. And I think that's one of the strengths that the IECA has is, is, is sharing those things, either either through their training webinars or at the conference. Yeah. I'm always surprised how little training there is on new software. Like when you get software for a department and then it if you get any training at all, it's really just like how to, and it doesn't get into any of the background calculations or best practices. Like you talked about Z score before. I think one of the problems that we have is that there's not any really any calculation on the analyst's part to calculate Z score. They're just clicking a couple of buttons on the program and it's spitting out a Z score. 
Yeah, again, I think this is one of the problems of this automation. I'll, I'll pick on geographically weighted regression. So I, I learned this from the from the forefathers that, that actually created this tool and, and have a different software program. That's kind of like I learned how to do density mapping using CrimeStat, uh, mm-hmm. you know, NIJ's CrimeStat program that was developed by Ned Levine, big fan of his. So yeah, so I, I think, again, unless there's that formal training process, unless there's that nuts and bolts understanding of what it is that you're using, because again, mm-hmm. it's it's very easy to throw a couple shape files into the GWR tool that Esri has built into their software now and come up with a map. The, the question is, are you going to be able to, again, translate that map properly and is that map was that map made properly as far as you know the the statistics and the kind of foundation that's necessary to do it to do a properly geographically weighted regression yeah i guess other than what we've already covered is there something you wish analysts knew about crime mapping you know it would be great if there was some kind of standard and again i, I applaud the the ieca for having a certification exam and for trying to develop like that baseline set of standards i guess mm-hmm. for the for the field because i i do think that that's necessary right like every analyst should know a little bit about statistics they should know a little bit about criminology they should know hopefully a little more about mapping because i think that that's a big part of the analyst job these days they should mm-hmm. know a little bit about maybe the the law or you know public policy so i i think that broad foundation of knowledge really contributes to you know the, how, how good an analyst can can do their job again having worked on the ambulance you know coming from this kind of victim perspective of crime in the you know i, I was always a big fan of telling my analysts to go out in the field and do ride-alongs with the cops and spend some time, you know, kind of shoulder to shoulder with the police, talking to a victim of crime, talking to a victim or talking to somebody who had their car stolen or talk to somebody that was in a bar fight or, you know, go to the hospital with the police when they have to interview somebody. You know, again, it, it gives them a different perspective of what those dots on a map are. Okay, good. All right. I'm going to move on now to really a very serious subject. I had mentioned to you on the prep call that I had planned at the IACA to uh, bring some analysts to a college campus there in in Chicago, and we had general plans with the University of Illinois at Chicago to have a TED Talk style event. And basically was told by the department chair that we weren't welcome due to the racial strife between police departments and civilians. It kind of threw me off a little bit because I didn't expect to be told that I wasn't welcome on a college campus. But then I got to talking with other people about it. And there seems to be really a movement by criminologists at universities to change the curriculum and really be anti-police I have no problem obviously folks being critical of police departments but we shouldn't be exclusive type of thing like we should be talking these out and trying to come up with best practices so i i know you've done some work and have experienced this yourself having been law enforcement coming in and working at a university. So I wanted to take some time to unpack this a little bit and get your thoughts. Yeah. So no doubt that there's, and again, this kind of just goes towards the concept of bias in general. You know, I was talking to my students today of actually in, in class about it. So again, there are cops that make mistakes. And again, I'll, I'll pick on the George Floyd incident, right? You got a, a couple cops that make a mistake. You have George Floyd who ends up dead. You have, you know, really worldwide protests as a result of a couple bad cops that make, that make some bad decisions. And you have a victim that ends up dying, you know, in police custody. So, but again, this one incident really kind of tarnished the reputation and a lot of the good kind of community partnerships that a lot of police departments have put a lot of time and energy in. So, you know, just like it's not fair to, you know, categorize groups of people, whether it's age, race, gender, religion, sexual preference, et cetera. I mean, I, I, unfortunately, I think that's what happens nowadays is people see the co- the police or the badge or the, the uniform or the, or the, the patch. And they say like, Oh, you're, a, you're on that team. And it's really <laughs> become like a, you know, 
you know, oh, you're a part of the policing profession or you're a part of that team. I'm on the other team or I'm on a different team. You know, I'm not against your team, but I'm certainly not a big supporter of your team anymore because of these, you know, you know, high profile kind of incidents where, again, cops are doing bad things or, or wrong things. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess how do we move forward? I mean, how do we get people at the table if they're not even willing to talk? Yeah, it's certainly fractured relationships, not only in higher education, where, like you said, maybe police departments are no longer allowed to recruit on campus, or college students are no longer looking at law enforcement as a as a good profession or a good job. You know, I just think that, and then, you know, you run into the operational part of this, which is, you know, police departments are have fractured relationships sometimes with the communities that they police. So obviously, if the citizens that are supposed to be, again, right, contributing and helping to the public safety of the community are not calling 911 and reporting crime, if they're not assisting in investigations, either as a witness or as a, I heard some information from someone, you know, that really breaks down the relationship with the police in the community. And then you run into this kind of downwards, you know, you know, slide or downward kind of spiral of, you know, police then get a little demoralized or, hey, if the community doesn't want to help me solve this crime, you know, I don't get paid any more money to solve this crime kind of thing. So you have, a you know, lower clearance rates, you have lower police morale, you have lower citizen interaction or, or community participation. And I just think it's a very unfortunate and a very negative, like I said, downward spiral that can really impact community safety long term. Yeah. Up to the police departments, I think, to try to figure out, OK, we got to figure out a new way or we got to try to put a new spin on this or we got to try to come up with a new something like N NYPD has this, you know, neighborhood community officer. You know, they call them NCOs, right? Like there's a neighborhood community officer that's attached to every neighborhood now in the, in the city. And this is like their way of saying, hey, we're going to put a cop you know, or a couple cops typically in the neighborhood. And it's only it's like their job to listen to you. It's their job to hear all the complaints you have, whether it's about the police department, but it's also their job to get a better understanding of crime in this community and, you know, again, become that lot of like liaison between police department and, and community. Yeah. And I think police departments do try. I, I, I will say that is they do try. They do try to come up with new ways to solve old problems. And I do think that most places are fairly open. And one of the things that comes to mind as we're talking is that this idea of like, okay, why are you sending a cop in a mental illness situation? And it's not like the police department was like, we have to go there. We want to go there. It's, you know, it's a lot of times no one else would go the mental health officials on their side didn't have the capability or capacity to respond to these calls so you know the only one left is either fire or police and but i've now seen that there are cities that are gearing up to that if it is a mental health situation that they are trying to send mental health care workers to the scene so it's not just the cops showing up every time yeah i think the mental health issue has certainly been one of the the more high profile things that's you know i guess police have been known for maybe not not doing as well as they could mm -hmm. so you know part, again part of that goes back to training uh, right. How many hours in the police academy are, you know, cadets or rookies getting in mental health training? I think that's one of the one of the big things, you know, for the longest time, it was like, you know, they got 40 hours of training on their firearm and they got, you know, four to eight hours of mental health training. So mm -hmm. they became really good at shooting their gun and, you know, gun safety kind of stuff. But when it came to dealing with, again, the people with mental illness, you know, they really didn't learn or, you know, learn, either learn in the, in the classroom or learn on the job, right. How to deal with those people properly. 
So, uh, you know, th I think there's a bunch of different issues with regards to mental health calls. You know, the I think the easy one is to understand, like you said, like the I don't think the police enjoy or appreciate or request to go to any of these calls. You know, these are the calls that can go sideways pretty quickly. And there's been, again, I, I can think of, of specific police officers who have been killed, literally been killed by, by EDPs, all because of, again, incidents that started off as not a big deal and then all of a sudden, you know, became a pretty big deal. And uh, again, officers' lives were lost along the way. So again, it's not that cops want to want to go to these calls, but like you said, you know, who, who else is going to go? So if it is a, a crazy man with a gun, like the reality is the social worker is also not trained to deal with that problem or the mm -hmm. psychologist is not trained to kind of deal with that problem. Maybe on the phone they are, but they're not trained to deal with the crazy person that's locked them up in their apartment or is holding someone hostage now or has their kids hostage, whatever, with a, with a handgun. I'm like, you know, you know, a lot of people are not trained to tackle that problem. So I, I love the, the police departments that, again, are, are being proactive and, and and innovative and are partnering with social workers on some of these calls. But like, I, I don't ever see a time, I guess, again, if it's a, if it's strictly a medical call, person is off their meds, person is in, you know, no threat to anybody, you know, family is just requesting assistance, you know, by all means, you know, send the social worker, don't send the police there. But the reality is, you know, who, who's going to protect the social worker, you know, if, if, and when things go bad, because again, sometimes, sometimes they do. I mean, that's just the nature of dealing with mental health emergency calls is, you know, sometimes they don't go according to plan. So mm -hmm. I don't ever foresee social workers taking over the job of police officers, just like I don't ever see police officers taking the job of social workers. You know, I, I think it's great that there are departments now that are hiring, you know, psychologists and full-time social workers to assist the police, whether it's in training or whether it's actually going on calls. And, you know, trying to de-escalate these problems, because I think that's that's a great thing. But again, I, I don't ever see these, you know, th these two people changing jobs ever. Yeah. Hmm. Good stuff there. All right. Well, let's finish up the show with the words of the world. This is where I give the guests the last word. You can promote any idea that you wish. Christopher, what are your words to the world? My words to the world will be all about training or education. So... Get back in the classroom and either get some formal training, whether that's at your local college or, again, investing some time in the IECA conference and really spending some time at some of the more uh, advanced, let's call it hands-on, maybe Esri Lab kind of stuff. Or, again, you know, figuring out where the field is going or figuring out the software tools that you would want to learn and then trying to figure out new and creative ways to learn that, right? Take advantage of all these great webinars that are out there. Again, talk to, I think this is one of the perks of the IECA when they have all the vendor booths, right? Again, find out, not only find out about the products, but find out about how you can get trained or how you can learn more about these products. I think that those are all great things that are going to make you a better analyst, but are also going to make departments better departments. And then again, hopefully we can fix all the problems of the world. <laughs> Very good. Well, I leave every guest with you. Give me just enough to talk bad about you later. Yeah. I guess we'll leave it at that. <laughs> but I do appreciate you being on the show, Chris. Thank you so much. And you Excellent, be safe. Jason. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate the, the opportunity to be on the show.